Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Pre-Calculus Unit 1 Review. No calculator, okay. There are a couple things I need to talk about this review. Um, there are a couple problems that are actually a little bit harder than anticipated. Um, so some of the things I'm actually going to tell you to disregard that you shouldn't worry about. Um, but for the most part, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the things that you need to know and how to do the problems. So let's get started. Number one, actually to tell you the truth, number one is not part of number two. So what we want to do is we want to actually scribble that out. So let's scribble out number two. So number one is actually tied to both of these problems. So what I'm going to do here is it says which of the following represents the relationship between f of x and g of x. So I'm relating um, f of x to g of x. So what I'm starting with is I'm going to start at kind of those points in which it's a little jagged. So I'm going to get those order pairs. That's so going to be negative two, negative two here. I'm going to call that a. And then the point that corresponds with it on the other side, I'm going to call that a prime. So I'm going to call that negative 3, comma, negative 4 over there. Uh, the next point I'm going to use, so you want to try and use two points, uh, something that kind of lines up. And I could have used the 3 and the 2 over there for how it kind of ended. Um, but I'm going to use the, the a and the b right here. Okay, so this is going to be 2, comma, 2. And over here, this is going to be um, now 1, comma, 4. So what I want to do here is I want to relate the x values. So I want to relate the x values. How did the x values change? And how did the y values change? So taking a look at just the x values, you can see that they actually, from a to a prime, b to b prime, they actually went down by one. So minus one, minus one. So which means that the graph has actually shifted one unit to the left. So one unit left. Okay, so we have to look to see which one is going to be one unit to the left. Now, since kind of with um, this multiple choice problem, it makes it really easy to determine which one is actually one unit to the left, but I'm just going to still continue like that, you know, if I was actually making this on my own. The next thing I take a look at is I now look at the Y values, see how the Y values relate. So the Y values, it's not as simple as adding or subtracting, right? This goes from negative two to negative four. The other one goes from two to four. So um, we need to find some type of consistent value or operation that I need to get from A to A prime for the Y value. Same thing from B to B prime. So if I take a look, is there something that might be the same? Well, if I actually multiply by 2, negative 2 times 2, that gives me negative 4, and 2 times 2, which gives me 4, there we go. There's our value that is consistent, right? Uh, it's not actually shifting up or down. What this is going to do is it's actually going to make it stretch and stretch vertically because it's the y value. Now, the part that deals with the vertical stretch is actually going to be the a value. So the a value of f of x. Okay. So, and then if I'm talking about un moving it one unit to the left, that's going to be f of x plus 1. So combine those two together, the a, and since it's a multiple of 2, I'm going to say 2 out in front. 2, f of x plus 1, and that's going to be exactly a. Okay, moving on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to now take a look at the domain range of each function. Now, the domain for this won't be too bad, but the range is where it starts to get a little bit tricky and it's actually a very advanced concept, especially if you don't have a calculator. So what we're going to do is we're actually not going to worry about the range for the J value. Okay, you're not going to have it on your test, so don't even worry about it. So let's start off with the domain for F. The domain, since this is actually going to be a line, okay, since this is going to be a line, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and think about what X values can I plug in? Can I plug in a negative? Can I plug in a positive? Can I plug in zero? Well, basically I can plug in anything. So that's going to make all real numbers. The next one, the range of F. The range of f. Now, same thing with the, the dealing with the line. You can plug in any type of y value, so there's no restrictions there, so it's going to be all real numbers. Okay, so domain for f is going to be all reals. Range is going to be all reals as well. Remember, you can also write as interval notation negative infinity to positive infinity. The next one, um, the domain for g. Now, remember, this is a parabola. 
So if it's a parabola, um, still, yet again, any x value that you can plug in, you should be able to. Now, the tricky part here is the range. So we have to take a look at what this graph is going to be. So um, this is a normal parabola, just at 16 units down. So at 16, the graph comes up just like this. So you can see that the lowest value is actually at negative 16, but it actually hits the graph at negative 16. So the lowest value is negative 16. So this negative 16 is less than or equal to y. You could also write it in interval notation, including the 16, excuse me, the negative 16, comma, all the way to infinity. So that's another way of organizing that. Okay, h of, or domain of h. So this is a square root function, so it comes out, just does kind of one of those things. Uh, the domain, so what values can you plug in or what values can't you? The important thing to remember is anything underneath the square root cannot be equal to zero. So what I write here is I write 7x minus 9 is going to be greater than or equal to zero. So you have to set it up just like that. Um, so do some calculations, 7x is greater than or equal to 9. And then we divide both sides by 7. So we get here, x is going to be greater than or equal to 9 sevenths, or we could also write it as 9 sevenths. Remember, we're including a bracket, comma, parenthesis, uh, comma, infinity, parentheses. Now the range, on the other hand, this one's a little tricky as well. Since we are moving this 9 units to, um, well, it's being shifted one way, shape, or form. Um, the important thing to remember here is the only value that this can be underneath the radical is actually zero. That's the lowest value that it could possibly be. As soon as it goes to negative one, negative two, it's not possible because we can't have a negative value. So the lowest value that we can actually get here is zero. So square root of zero is actually just zero. So the smallest value that you can have for the y is actually going to be y is greater than or equal to zero. And that's it. Um, and we can also write it in interval notation, bracket, zero, comma, infinity, close parenthesis. All right, now let's work on um, the domain and range for the last one. Now, like I said, we're not going to worry too much about the range. Um, and actually, one of the best ways to do it is by taking a look at the graph. But yet again, it's not something that you need to know about. So let's just focus on the domain for this problem. So the domain of j. Well, the important thing is to try and think about, OK, instead of what can you plug in, what can't you plug in? So the idea here is that we want to try and say, OK, we don't want the bottom to be equal to 0. So <laughs> let's set it equal to 0. Um, one of the things I can see here is it is a perfect quadratic. I can um, I can factor out. Um, I can see what two numbers multiply to give me 20, but they add to give me negative 9. That's going to be minus 4 and minus 5. So, which means that the values that you can't actually have down the bottom are going to be 4 and 5. So we're going to say all real numbers except 4 and 5. Okay, so we're not going to worry about the range. Like I said, it's not going to be on there. Okay, moving right along. Um, the next one, these deal with the, the fog and the golf. Right, so the f of g of x. So the thing I like to start off with, I like to start off by writing down f of, and then whatever g of x is. So that's going to be x squared minus 16. Then I'm going to write down whatever f is. f parentheses, right, three parentheses plus 12. Now, whatever's inside that parentheses for the f, I just place that value right in there. So I'm going to place in x squared minus 16. Okay, we might need to do some evaluating. So 3 times x squared, so that's going to be 3x squared minus 48 plus 12. Let's evaluate this, get rid of the constants. So I am left with 3x squared um, minus 30. And there's my answer. And if you really wanted to factor out a 3, you could do so. So you would get x squared minus 12. And then times by 3. Okay, next one. G. So I'm going to start off with G of. I'm going to place the F in there. So that's going to be 3x plus 12. And then I'm going to write down what the G is. So open parentheses squared minus 16. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place right in there 3x plus 12. And since there's a 2 up top right for the exponent, I'm going to actually have to FOIL. So I'm going to rewrite as 3x plus 12 times 3x plus 12 minus 16. So let's do some work with these. So uh, 3x times 3x, which is going to give you 9x squared. 3x times 12, which is going to give you 36x. And then 36x plus 36x, which is actually going to give you 72x plus 144. And then minus 16. Combine the 144 and the 16. It gives you 128 on the end. And then rewrite your other terms. Okay, so you get 9x squared plus 72x plus 128. And that's going to be your final answer. Now, it says find the inverse of f of x and g of x. Which one is 1 to 1? Why? Well, since the first one is actually a line, you can do the horizontal line test and the vertical line test to figure out that this is actually going to be 1 to 1. Okay, so um, I'm going to take the first equation, f of x is equal to 3x plus 12. Then to figure out the inverse, I have to change it to y. y is equal to 3x plus 12 and replace the x in the y value. So I'm going to place x in for y and y in for x. Subtract the 12, I get x minus 12 is equal to 3y, and divide both sides by 3, and I end up getting, I'm just going to reorganize this, y is equal to 1 third x, because I'm doing x divided by 3, and also there's a 1 in front of the x, so I'm writing as 1 third x, just in slope intercept form to help us organize things a little bit better, minus 12 divided by 3, which is going to give us 4. Now I want to rewrite this as f, and then to the negative 1, which really means the inverse of x just so that we can keep things organized, is equal to 1 third minus 4. Excuse me, and almost forgot the x. So it is, the inverse function is going to be um, 1 third x minus 4. Now looking at both of these, both of these are going to be lines. Since they're both lines, they're both functions, and if they're both functions, then they're both 1 to 1. Next, the g of x. I'm going to write that down, that's going to be x squared minus 16 going to replace it with y. y is equal to x squared minus 16, and then replace the x in the y value. x goes here, y goes here. Solve for y. Add 16 to both sides, and I get uh, is equal to y squared. Now, at this point in time, when I do the square root to get rid of that squared, I have to remember that there can be two values here. I can have a positive value, or I could have a negative value for y. So I need to make sure that I also include both the positive and negative value. So if I rewrite this, y is equal to plus or minus the square root of x plus 16. Now, if you look at the original one, the original one's a parabola. But the g inverse of x is going to be equal to plus or minus the square root of x plus 16. And you're going to get something that looks like this. And that's not a function because if you do the vertical line test, it's going to intercept it twice, and then you're going to have an issue. So this is not 1 to 1 because both the original equation and the inverse both have to be functions. And if they're not both functions, then it's not 1 to 1.